without further ado, let's welcome Daniel to the stage. Uh, we could, yeah. Hello. Hello, Daniel. Okay, so Daniel, could you share also your screen right now? Yes. Yeah. There we go. Okay, I think we are all set. So I will Perfect. pass the time to you, Daniel. So. Perfect, and thank you for having me. Uh, and good morning, everyone. Um, my name is uh, Daniele Bernardi, um, and uh, I work uh, as um, a, a developer relation partner engineer at uh, Twitter, working with developers on the Twitter API. Um, it's funny, like I started to think about uh, this presentation actually almost exactly a year ago uh, this time. Um, and I thought that 2020 was going to be uh, kind of a, you know, a current start year for the future of data and, and information. I started thinking um, all this when nothing of this was even remotely imaginable, you know. Um, so all this obviously still holds true and we saw how uh, most of these conversations around uh, uh, health and how to design APIs around health actually were even accelerated by um, COVID and uh, all the rest of the global events. Well, we know that the United Nations said uh, it's tackling what it calls an infodemic. Um, it means that it's hard to distinguish information that's not attendable uh, from uh, reasonable and objective information that actually contributes to the progress of the public conversation. And this the distinguishing the two is actually a large and manual and process and presents scaling challenges. For example, how do we get the full data set on a topic? How do we direct people to the right information? And how do we contrast or report misleading or uh, inaccurate details? And we see platform trying to get to the root of this issue. Uh, two years ago, back in 2018, Jack Dorsey made a commitment to increase the health of the public conversation. We know what the public conversation is. It's this, basically this conversation layer of the internet. It's the conversation we have every day on the internet, actually. It's our thoughts, our way to express ourselves, uh, the way we receive and consume information. But what's interesting here is that uh, Jack doesn't just give the definition of the public conversation, also gives the definition of health. So let's go in uh, deeper detail and understand what the health of the public conversation actually means. When we talk about the health of the public conversation, we refer to any activity that adds to your life in a positive way. We go online to learn, to inform ourselves, uh, to connect with others, to keep ourselves updated, to communicate and get back uh, information we uh, find valuable, uh, stay updated on the latest cat memes. When we choose to make our collective interactions public, we shape a global conversation that can advance us as a society. But when we look back at the actual implementation of uh, this, what API design actually allows us to make that much progress? And how we can design it so, it, so that it's health oriented. And this is obviously a challenge that platforms had in the past. It's nothing new. API platforms were designed to work with uh, objects, um, but the notion of object stops at what an object is. APIs know what the, where an object is. They know what the type of that object is. Obviously they return the object's content, uh, but they also act in a silo and they have no awareness of the context of the object itself. So in order to enable users and developers with tools for uh, healthier conversations, we need to design APIs that are aware of their surrounding context. So right now, endpoints don't say much about the context around that object. Sure, like I said, we had the object's content, we have plenty of metadata, but the ability to frame that object into a much larger picture is always left out of an API product and its design. And this is an example. Suppose you wanted to get all the tweets sent on uh, Mother's Day. What would you do? You would probably search by uh, keywords. Uh, I'll do something like this. You'll have to, to, to look for specific tests and hashtags in order to get an initial set of tweets. Uh, but this is largely incomplete um, because the conversation can shift a lot in uh, tone and context. And you know, 2020 has been the prime example. 
uh, with a lot of mothers in uh, the front line who couldn't celebrate the way they deserved this year. The conversation about uh, Mother's Day was radically different than 2019. So this is what an incomplete keyword search query would look like. Um, for example, what if someone uses a slightly different set of words? What if there's a typo in the tweet? And you can probably imagine how big our search query has to be in order to capture the full global conversation in many languages across the world. So how can we make an API aware of its surrounding context in this case? We could probably use artificial intelligence and it can really help here, actually, uh, specifically natural language processing. Platforms have invested significant amounts of uh, money and efforts into the understanding of uh, AI in the past few years, and they aim their efforts to help moderation and uh, internal processes as well. So we seem to be in a fairly mature stage to see useful applications of uh, classification systems, just like NLP, um, that can be opened up to the broader developer ecosystem. One way to achieve contextual awareness is by annotating text through named entity recognition, uh, like I said. So we can basically map text to things like names and places. So even if they're not in the same language, those tweets are all about the same topic. A holiday called Mother's Day, uh, which is exactly what we see in uh, the payload right here. So we can then start representing things like tweets, not in form of keywords, but in form of entities, like metadata that's not really present as the corpus of the text, but it's extracted based on the surrounding context. Um, so in a health-oriented design, those three tweets will share the same annotations. And we can use entities to get tweets about the specific context we're looking for. So this way we can go from our you know, previous search query to something like this. Uh, so we can still use keywords in this case if we wanted to, but what it counts is that we have a, you know, the domain and the context. Uh, so we want to get a specific, specific tweets about specific holidays. Um, and then we can further refine, so you know, using the old the traditional methods here. But the real power and the reason this works so well is because named entity recognition is aware of the surrounding context of uh, a particular piece of information. For example, a tweet in this case. Um, so let's take this tweet for example. Tigers will be back in San Francisco playing against the Giants. Now, if you're into sports, this may sound familiar. Um, and we know that um, you know, we can possibly also already understand some of the entities here that have been discussed, like the Detroit Tigers and the San Francisco Giants. San Francisco is not an entity per se, like the city. It's not an entity in this case, because we're not talking about the city of San Francisco, but we're talking about a team that's based in San Francisco. Now, I also you know, have a limited understanding of this and uh, who the Tigers and the Giants might be. Now I know they're sports teams, but of which sports? And this is exactly the problem with the lack of contextual awareness. Um, and um, we, not too long ago, we released the new Twitter API v2, which actually embed contextual annotations like the ones that you're seeing right now. Um, and they're just including the payload and they're available to everybody. Um, there's no additional uh, you know, step to take to, to actually get it. You get it as part of the tweet payload. Um, so in this case, you can actually look at the overall context. And when you do that, you understand that we're actually talking about baseball and specifically uh, major league. Uh, and those are, again, all things that come as part of the metadata. So this is how platforms uh, like ours can shape their API for uh, health. And specifically, we're taking a radically different approach here for our V2 API platform. Um, we know that developers want to improve the public conversation, but they feel they don't have the means to make a positive impact. Uh, and to make sure they do, we have this twofold strategy. So the first is to give developers the tools to better understand the public conversation. It can help their users to have uh, a better experience online and an experience that limits the amount of uh, known content that they have to see and uh, witness. And an example of this is the COVID-19 stream endpoint we released earlier this year. This API gives developers a real-time stream of tweets about this topic and making this accessible um, to everybody with a legitimate use case for free is probably one of the most uh, valuable things I've seen uh, 
you know, Twitter doing uh, very recently. And um, as the world comes together to protect our communities and to seek answers to pressing challenges, this is extremely important and valuable to have. Like I said, this is a streaming endpoint. So it delivers real time tweet and the full conversation uh, filtered by the COVID-19 context annotation. So we apply the, the technology you saw uh, and I just demonstrated here to uh, the COVID-19 topic. So this API only returns tweets that are marked as COVID-19 as detected by our artificial intelligence, regardless of the language or the territory. So in this case, uh, we that's exactly uh, how we're going to uh, drive the understanding of the public conversation. And uh, this API is obvi obviously think, uh, thought uh, um, about um, health and it's built thinking of that. So in the legacy world, if you had to, you know, build something like this in uh, 2019 and 2018 and the years before, you would uh, need access to the data sets. You would then need to set up the right keywords to get the best comprehensive corpus to use as a training model for uh, your um, entity recognition models. Um, there are some entity recognition API in the marketplace, but they're not trained on uh, tweets or data set of tweets. And we know that the language of Twitter, because it's shorter, it's also different than uh, a full text corpus. So for maximum accuracy, you would need to train your own models. And that you know, takes time and effort. And the, the one thing we didn't have in 2020 was time. Instead, the platform should and, call, uh, and can factor all this consideration to one single API, which is exactly what we did as part of this health-oriented design. Um, and um, this is how we offer this. Uh, uh, endpoints out there so that we could enable a better developer experience, which in turn can have positive implications in the ecosystem. So with one single endpoint, developers are, are also now able to research the spread of the disease, understand the spread of uh, misinformation, uh, build solutions for uh, things like crisis management, emergency response, and communication within communities, uh, develop machine learning data tools to further help the scientific community, uh, understand how certain communities or countries are uh, experimenting with uh, certain treatments and find papers that are being shared online. There, there's a lot of use cases that are very valuable here. So giving better understanding via context uh, awareness is just one of the aspects of an health-oriented design, like I said, better understanding. Building better tools for enhancement is the second aspect. And for a content platform specifically, um, as an aspect of this is health of the public conversation. And it goes without saying that everybody should feel safe and comfortable sharing their thoughts on the internet. Sometimes people may receive replies that are not relevant or uh, off topic or downright toxic. They may find it difficult or even not possible uh, to prevent this, pro this problem is good. They don't have the, the tools. And it, obviously it's not ideal for the platform, but it's also not ideal for people using the platform. So last year we added a way to uh, hide replies to a conversation. And people hide replies for many reasons, including to you know, remove comments that are abusive, irrelevant, or distracting. And while many people want the benefits to um, hide replies to improve the quality of their conversations, some people receive such a large number of uh, replies that it's difficult or even overwhelming to do so without help. Additionally, some people may want help to automatically hide replies that contain offensive or abusing language. They don't want to be exposed to that kind of language. So even when you have the tools, the, you might not have the time, the energy, or even the emotional fortitude to deal with all this. And this is where a health-oriented API design can help. This is also when, where developers can help. So when an API platform has tools to solve these problems at scale, developers can help users have a better and safer experience. An example of this um, health-oriented API to, orient, to improve the public conversation is the Hide Replies API. And with this API, developers can build tools that help people hide replies to their tweets faster, more efficiently, or in circumstances where they normally uh, give up. So this is an API that uh, really helps uh, in creating healthy participation in the public conversation. A user can delegate hiding replies to an app based on uh, criteria that this app defines. So for example, when the user tweets as usual, 
behind the scenes, the app can be integrated with uh, a real-time API. And we have one, actually, it's called the Accounts Activity API that checks for replies. This can even happen in real time, like I said, and um, you can also do that asynchronously in um, you know, uh, delegating statically. There are many ways of doing this. So the apps can check for one or more criteria and the app uh, defines what the criteria can be. Like maybe the, um, the app uh, uh, can check for uh, uh, a keyword list that's defined by the author. So uh, you basically allow or deny certain words from appearing in your replies. Uh, you can uh, hide replies be because of the presence over the or the absence of certain topics detected from uh, the natural language processing metadata, uh, or um, because certain people or uh, certain topics are mentioned or not, and then hide replies uh, accordingly. Uh, an example of health-oriented API design is actually uh, one API that's called Perspective API from Jigsaw. Uh, Jigsaw is a unit within Google. Uh, this API uses machine learning models to score the perceived impact that a comment might have on a conversation. So developers and publishers can actually use the score that the API gives you to help moderators do their job. So basically, by analyzing the corpus of text, the respective API can tell you that maybe this corpus has a likelihood to uh, be similar to comments this API has seen in the past. Uh, and if that's the case, you can uh, take action uh, accordingly. Uh, or like with it, you can connect it to another API, uh, like the high replies API, for example, like I just mentioned, and uh, have them work together. So when the perspective API de defines um, a piece of comment that potentially is marked as toxic, you can hide it. Um, the API, like I said, is integrated with uh, Twitter. It's, if you actually go to developer.twitter.com, there's, there's an example you can clone for free and uh, include in your application or uh, uh, basically recreate or, uh, uh, or remix to, to your liking. Um, so when you connect it with a Twitter account, in real time, replies come in. And um, those are analyzed without being sent to Google, actually. Um, they are uh, hidden in uh, uh, real time without user action. Uh, if they are deemed to be uh, upon a certain very high likelihood of being uh, abusive or toxic. So when we enable experiences like this, end users are not the only to benefit, obviously. The platform can immediately create a whole new ecosystem that uh, um, is uh, integrated with your app and embedded into it to improve the main experience. The app I just mentioned that's basically running almost like in background. So while you actually consume your tweets, there's this app that checks your replies and hides the replies that are not relevant to you. Um, and obviously, this strategy puts developers uh, front and center into your app by using this API design. And it opens up to new opportunities for them to enable better experiences. So in the legacy world, we saw users rely mostly on themselves to improve the main online experience. Um, this could be challenging for uh, internal processes as well, because you know the more uh, you have to rely on users, the more uh, you add a hurdle on your uh, internal processes, and the more false positives you receive. And there's uh, this kind of vicious circle that gets uh, triggered because of that. Um, so uh, in this case, those process wouldn't scale, or uh, the experience that are created might limit the fruition of content in a way that would not scale well across multiple languages or markets. In uh, a health-oriented design, uh, we actually use uh, the involvement of developers that contribute actively uh, into the main user experience, directing them and helping them with tools to perform tasks like moderation, like just we, we just saw, that were too cumbersome to tackle. And also, developers can help you scale in areas where you can actually uh, focus your efforts. So this is the case, for example, when you're localizing in a region where you don't have uh, a focused understanding uh, or even a presence. You can partner with developers in that region that have, might have the best understanding better than yours as a first party platform and help you curate that understanding back into the platform. So uh, to sum it up, by giving developers tools for better understanding and better tools to action their understanding together, uh, you can create an advanced ecosystem that respects and improves everyone's experience online. Um, and this is all I had. Uh, thank you. Uh, I appreciate, obviously, any questions you might have. OK.
Okay. Thank you, Daniel, for the in-depth talk about the health-oriented API uh, from, from Twitter. So we will open the floor for some questions. So I think I, we, we've got several questions from the front stage on, about uh, uh, the experience that users have on Twitter about the, the, uh, the health and, and, and the, the toxic experience that the users may have. And it seems that uh, uh, you have explained uh, from the developer's perspective that developer, developers can uh, make use of the API and and to to do that all sort all, all sorts of like filtering hiding and what about the users so from the users perspective how uh, is Twitter enabling them to, to have a certain like similar experience as well so I think that's um, that's uh, the, the summary of several questions of that over there yeah yeah um, so it, it, it's great one thing that uh, it's probably worth mentioning is that we're uh, our our strategy and our vision is to basically open up those uh, um, those settings for users uh, to developers as well, so that you know users can uh, uh, almost like curate their settings on the background in ways that the main Twitter experience can't. Uh, and high replies in this way is you know one, but also um, we've seen uh, a lot of uh, uh, other interesting applications. Like you know, there's an application called uh, Block Together. And it helps you basically curate a list mm. of uh, people or criteria for which you don't want you want to mute or block or follow or unfollow people. And taking these actions helps you curate their, your feed. And this configuration can also help you curate other configurations on uh, other platforms, for example. And uh, mm. that that's one way of uh, basically having users. Um, curate as much as possible their experience. My personal opinion is users should have the best possible experience without bothering too much about you know those settings. Yeah. And to do so, we are actually exposing more and more of um, control back to them and also surfacing things they might be interested in in a way that uh, um, that's more natural and flows uh, more naturally with them. Like an example is topics. Like sometimes we follow a lot of people because they are talking about a specific topic, um, and this is exactly the same technology behind the scenes, like uh, contextual annotations. We use contextual annotations to tag tweets based on uh, the perceived category, um, based on uh, obviously machine learning, um, and based on that, you can basically browse not just by hashtag or uh, by content or by searching things, but uh, you can actually instead search by uh, the the topic. So if somebody is talking about pets or somebody is talking about drawing pets, you can actually get that. Uh, there's like one category that's bird watching. I don't even know how to search for bird watching on Twitter, but there's a category and uh, you can basically just get that and get all this curated, uh, automatically curated tweets about that category. Or uh, sports, which is one of the categories that works best. It's also one of the, um, the topics that's the most talked about uh, on uh, on Twitter and uh, it just works pretty well. So the strategy overall is basically to give users more and more ways to uh, to have the experience they want to have. Because in the end, uh, one of our metrics and one, uh, one of our goals is to is for users to leave Twitter with uh, better value than when they came in uh, for the first time. Great, great, great. I think it's about time. So I if if. We, uh, our audience have uh, several other questions. You could try to message uh, Daniel for further discussion. And yeah, thank you, Daniel. Thank you. Thank you.